Welcome, everyone. This morning's speaker is a pilot, an instructor, a writer, a speaker, and a humorist. He's wonderful to listen to. He's lots of fun. However, what Mark has to say today is a very serious message about flight instruction and about pilot decision making. Please welcome Mark Grady. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, Kathleen. And Welcome to the FA Safety Center. For those of you watching on the World Wide Web live here at Sun and Fun, wish you were here with us, but we do have a somewhat live studio audience with us today. And for those of you watching at home on DVD, it may not be live, but just like it is, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. Big thank you to the FA Safety Team and the FA Safety Center here in Lakeland, Florida. And a big special thank you to the folks at the FA Production Studios here. All of these and all these cameras up in that uh, ominous looking booth upstairs with Obi Young and Hugh and the crew up there directing all this are the volunteer crew members that are making this possible for you at home to watch this on the internet and also to have this uh, stream all over the world to pilots to help them become a little bit safer. Let's give the FA production team a big hand for their work and what they're doing here in Florida. Also, how many of you have been to FASafety.gov? Have you gotten there and got signed up? If not, that is the way to find out about local safety seminars coming to your area. Please go there. You simply put in an email address, how far you're willing to travel, and it will tell you, give you email safety alerts about how you get to that particular area and, so, and where those safety seminars are. Now, I, believe it or not, I travel all over the country and talk to pilots, and every once in a while we hear a few of them say, I don't want to give the FA my email address. Well, that's all right. You don't have to worry about that. Just simply go there periodically and look up these events, put in your zip code, how far you're willing to travel. You just have to remember to do that periodically. Of course, the Internet's a valuable tool, and as far as aviation safety is concerned, we certainly found that out at the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. As a matter of fact, let's go back to AOPA headquarters and find out what you can find in the area of safety education online on the Internet. tough to stay up to speed. Fortunately, staying current just got a whole lot easier. That's because the AOPA Air Safety Foundation has developed an easy to use website that puts all our resources right at your fingertips. www.asf.org is the source for busy pilots who want the best in safety education without all the hassle. You can take full FAA approved online courses, test your knowledge with self-scoring quizzes, research accident reports, or catch up on the latest airspace changes right in your own home. And the best part is, it's all free. Let's take a look. Suppose you want to learn how to get the most from your handheld GPS. Just go to the online courses page and click on GPS for VFR operations. Or if your weather IQ isn't quite what it should be, you might want to check out our Weather Wise courses. They're designed to help you stay on Mother Nature's good side. Maybe you're a flatlander hoping to learn about mountain flying. Or maybe you'd like to know more about your airplane's engine, how it works, and how to keep it running smoothly. Whatever the topic, our easy-to-use online courses put the latest multimedia technology to work to get you up to speed. But that's not all. Our online accident database makes it easy to learn from others' mistakes and because it's cross-referenced to AOPA's online airport directory, AOPA members can use the database to find out what kinds of accidents have taken place at their cross-country destinations. If you're looking for print publications, our entire library of safety advisors and special reports is online too. Want to learn more about icing, avoiding thunderstorms, fuel management, operating at towered airports? It's all there. If you're taking instruction, you might want to check out our research on the truth about safety and in instructional flying, or maybe our report on the safety of technically advanced aircraft. We've even got downloadable flashcards to help you brush up on airspace or runway safety. Staying current is just as important as it ever was. And thanks to the AOPA Air Safety Foundation website, it's gotten a whole lot easier. www.asf.org. Give it a try. You won't believe what you've been missing. 
How many of you have ever been online and taken one of our online courses? A slew of you. Fantastic. And there's a new one on there, which is GPS for IFR operations, quickly becoming one of the most popular downloadable uh, courses on the Internet. Go check it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. Sure is good to be back in Florida and sunny and fun after taking a year off last year. And one more person we want to thank, our a special delegation here today. We have a special guest with us here at the production studios, a delegation from Costa Rica, Captain Senor Captain Rod and his wife. Thank you. Let's give them a hand coming up from that that beautiful country. It's good to have you with us today and welcome to Sun and Fun. I hope you're enjoying yourself so far when you're down here. As, as Kathleen told you, my name is Mark Grady and it, uh, I'm from North Carolina if you can't tell that already. But it's good to be here and I'll tell you, uh, one thing Kathleen didn't tell you that's probably a little bit scary when you find this out is I have over 6,000 hours in a Cessna 152. Now you can imagine the kind of response I get from people when they find that out. Uh, my favorite response of all time is there's, there's, there's a safety seminar heckler that shows up in Rochester, New York at all the seminars. And when he found out I had 6,000 hours in 152, he hollered out and he said, hey, was that before or after your check ride? So as you can imagine, um, I said, that's all right. We got a good sense of humor in North Carolina. I did arrange for him to be ramp checked the next day. It's good to have friends at the FAA, but all that time wasn't from instructing. It was from being an airborne traffic watch pilot reporter for 10 years in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I did a lot of flying around over a small geographic area, watching people run into each other. It was a lot of fun. But one of the neat things, and especially a lot of new pilots always think this is really cool, is these companies would come to town and they want to, you know, show off their equipment or get us to give them a free plug. So they bring these really unique flying machines with them and then they would want me to fly it and they give me free instruction and I'd do these reports and so one of the neatest flying machines I ever flew in my life was this one. Anybody know type aircraft? Hey this is the Blockbuster Video Blimp and I've got time in this thing and this changed my life as far as flying is concerned especially with air traffic control. Matter of fact I used to tell the controllers in Raleigh area you better be nice to me or I'll come back and shoot an ILS in this thing. <laughs> it takes about 45 minutes to shoot a full ILS in the Blockbuster Video Blimp. It was a lot of fun. Oh, one thing brand new I want to tell you about. I know this is a big title, AOPA Accident Forgiveness and Deductible Waiver Enhancement Program. What does that mean? Well, what it means is insurance companies are starting to find out, and they've known this, that pilots who participate in regular safety training are safer pilots. And we got our insurance company on board. If you're an AIG policyholder, listen closely to this. If you attend one Air Safety Foundation safety seminar, either live or on the internet every six months, then what are you going to get for that? Well, if you're an AIG policyholder, they're going to give you an accident forgiveness plus deductible waived up to $100. Every little bit helps folks and this is a great program. To find out more about it you have to fill in a registration certificate you'll have on the back table and turn that in and you'll get a certificate for attending the program today. Please fill out the card. It looks a little bit different from this. We've got a special version here at Sun and Fun but fill that out and make sure you fill that out today. So don't forget AIG policyholders fill out and turn in that registration card today. If you want some more information on this just simply go to ASF.org accident forgiveness and you'll get all all the details about this brand new program. All right, we're here to talk today about doing the right thing. Now, when I first heard the title of the program they were working on at the AOP Air Safety Foundation, I got to thinking about the old character actor Wilford Brimley. Remember him? Do you remember when he used to do the Quaker Oats commercials? He used to say, how did he used to end that commercial? It's the right thing to do. In a weird kind of way, I got to thinking that's very similar to the decision making of pilots. Wilford Brimley made the point that, you know, we may know we're supposed to eat right, we may know we're supposed to do certain things as far as our diet is concerned, but putting that into practical use isn't always that easy, is it? So today we're going to talk about trying to make that diet and aviation a little safer, just like we need to eat right when we're trying to sit at the table as well. You know, you don't have to even read NTSB reports. Just look at photographs of accidents and you can determine that probably aeronautical decision-making was involved. Remember this one? 
This was at Boeing Field in Seattle where that guy got tangled up in that 150 coming into power lines. Now I'll tell you something, I, I get picked on so much about having so much time in the 150 and 152, but I wasn't glad this happened, but I was glad of the outcome of it because they got a bucket truck up to this guy in this airplane, got him out, virtually no damage to the pilot whatsoever. And the amazing thing is they came back the next day, got the airplane out of the power lines, and there was no, virtually no damage to the aircraft. Make fun of a 150 now, huh? It's like a Timex, man. It's a great airplane. So uh, it's, a, it's a great one. Big boys make mistakes. I always wondered in the next shot what the debriefing was after this incident. <laughs> Hope there wasn't any brass riding in that Jeep is all I got to say because that guy got in big trouble. And you know, even passengers on board aircraft practice poor aeronautical decision making. Don't believe it? Look at this. You know, people feel if there's a button or something, they just got, as they say down south, mash it. And as a result, the results are not always pretty, are they? Here's why we're here today and why we have a whole hour set aside for those of you watching at home on the web and for those of you that are here today to talk about aeronautical decision making. The numbers speak for themselves. Look at this. In the all accident and fatal accident categories, 76% of the time we get in trouble in general aviation is the result of poor, not just uh, pilot error, but judgment related pilot error. That's scary, isn't it, to know that it's our fault when we get in trouble that much time. In reality, these numbers are NTSB numbers, but in reality, they're even a little higher than this. Why? Because of the fact that some accidents are placed in categories. One of the big ones is spatial disorientation. And that's where pilots get in a little bit of trouble. The accident's blamed on spatial disorientation, but in reality, what's the real reason? Well, the pilot had poor aeronautical decision making that got them in to this spatial disorientation situation in the first place. So things have changed. You know, in, up to the early 40s, a lot more accidents were blamed directly on the aircraft themselves. Uh, why? Well, aeronautical engineering is an evolving science. Uh, aircraft engines today are a lot more dependable than they were up until the early 40s, aren't they? So we kind of fixed that problem. Another thing was the issue of dealing with the situation of the actual equipment on board the airplane and getting information to pilots. So now we don't have a problem with that, thanks to the internet and all this uh, information directly beamed into the cockpit of the airplane with this overlay information of GPS, it is right there in front of you and this has helped a little bit in the weather avoidance area, but there's still problems. One side note, I don't want to get in a lot of decision making about GPS, we have a whole standalone seminar on that, but let me warn you about something, over dependence on that technology without the proper training is not good decision making either, is it? You know, air traffic control tells us that the number of times a general aviation pilot has to ask them for help has reduced substantially in the past of seven or eight years. Why? The number one reason is GPS. Pilots aren't getting lost as often, but ATC also tells us that when a general aviation pilot who is using GPS gets lost anyway, they get lost big time. As a matter of fact, ATC, I was talking to a guy in Atlanta Center. He said, Mark, I was working this fella, and he popped up on 121.5, declared an emergency. He was lost, and he confessed that the four AA batteries in his handheld transceiver had died, and he didn't even know what state he was flying over at the time. He said that guy was just fo blindly following that magenta line from God on that screen and when that thing died he didn't have a clue where he was. So be careful about decision making. So the problem we've got today is what? It is a human problem. And the tough part about dealing with this myself and as all of us as aviators is this. We've got to remember that we can be our own worst enemy in airplane. How many of you believe that? How many of you really believe it? I hope you do. Hey, if you don't think we're capable of being our own worst enemy, watch this.
Now here's a scary question for you. How many of you know pilots like this? This is the part that I don't want to get into. Well, anyway, just got to be careful we're flying around. You know what's at risk? Isn't it sad that in reality we've got a situation where it's hard to convince pilots to do the right thing just for the safety reasons. Isn't that sad? It's just like when people speed on the highways and on the interstates and traveling quickly around the uh, country too fast, you have to slow them down by fining them or tell them they're going to get in some other trouble. We've got more at risk other than just putting ourselves in danger if we don't get this decision making accident rate down or putting the people we love inside the airplane in danger as well. We don't want that to happen. It's good decision making. I just got married a couple weeks ago. My wife is in here. And we, she's, a, she's a pilot and an A&P. And, and one of the things that, we, you know, that I, if I ever had her in the airplane with me, it makes you get a little extra cautious, doesn't it? you got somebody you love on board. Same with the children on board the airplane. You worry a little bit more. But we need to remember we're putting the whole pilot population and freedom to fly at risk. You know our nighttime accident rate is so high that there's actually some hierarchy folks in the aviation world who think we ought to do away with nighttime VFR in the United States. Do we want that to happen to us? Absolutely not. And believe it or not, the solution to this is pretty simple. Don't ever, ever, ever go into an airport at night you haven't been into before, especially a non-towered airport, without talking to somebody there who has. As simple as that, because there's all these tricks of the trade, terrain, and features around that airport that just getting a briefing could save your life. And you know, every single ruling regulation that goes into federal aviation regulations uh, and the, uh, all that book is loaded as a result of poor decision making by pilots. Usually that's the case. Or a mistake. They have to put the fire out by creating a regulation. We don't want additional regulation, so we've got to be careful. Knowing, however, that 100% almost of all those regulations are a result of a pilot doing something wrong, that may, or somebody doing something wrong aboard an airplane. I fly a lot on airlines now to have to get around to the seminars. I always wondered, where did that placard inside the airlines come from, knowing that, that says on the doors, do not open in flight? Where did that come from? Some guys say, honey, I'll be back in just a minute. We got us a placard, you know, that's the way that works. Three main reasons we get in trouble in general aviation. Expecting too much out of the airplane is one of them. And for you lady pilots in here, this is predominantly a male issue, so you can pat yourself on the back. But after that, it all changes. We're all guilty after this of the others. Not enough ability in the airplane. And the most important one is this. We're having too much fun in aviation to pay attention to all the intimate details. So you've got to be careful. And, and why are we getting in this situation? We've targeted one of the number one issues is pilots do not invest enough in proficiency training. That's sad, isn't it? I mean, to know that, and you know, most of us look at the biennial flight review, they call it flight review now, is some kind of test that the FAA makes us do from time to time, and we just say, gosh, we hate to go back and be tested, and that's true. But if you want a good flight review, the best way to do it is don't look at it as a test, but an opportunity to work on it. And if in 76% of the time or more, we get in trouble in general aviation. It's our decision making that's at fault. Isn't it a good idea to go ahead and look at the flight review as an opportunity to work on those weak areas? We all have them and there's your opportunity. Plus another thing, airplanes aren't as capable as we like to believe sometimes. Knowing your aircraft well, most of us, and I've been guilty of this at times, you read that pilot operating handbook enough to get through the um, initial testing and you rarely look at it again. But that's something that requires constant review because we forget over a period of time how much we do forget. You know we lack in general aviation a lot of rigid regulations, standard operating procedures that by nature make the airline safer. We do. But that doesn't mean we can't put some of those lessons learned from it into practice for ourselves. Another factor involved in general aviation, we can't be all above average pilots. This is where the training and initial experience level is taking place. Another thing we've got to be careful of is believing all our own press. I mean, if you look at the trends, the accident rate was up a little bit if you read the NAL report from the AOPA Air Safety Foundation last year. But overall, the trend is for general aviation to be safer over a period of time. But that can lead to complacency, and that's a dangerous disease, isn't it? Matter of fact, how safe is it in general aviation? The numbers are really pretty encouraging. We took an hour and a half flight, saying that's an average leg for a pilot to make, 
or an hour and a half of flying around on a Saturday afternoon or whatever, and we said, what's the risk during that hour and a half flight? Want to see the numbers? Here they are. Your flight odds are pretty good. Your chance of having any accident during that hour and a half flight is .00009351. Pretty doggone good, huh? And your chance of having a fatality, 0.000180 to 1. But you see, after you've done the same thing over and over again for a long period of time and nothing happening, this is where that complacency bug gets into us and bites us. You want to hear a scary number, too, that really emphasizes this point? Do you know that ATP-rated pilots have more than twice as many stall-spin accidents than student pilots. In fact, the number one pilot category for stall spin accidents, commercial pilots. That's scary, isn't it? What's the problem there? It's complacency, no doubt about it. So we met the problem today, how do we fix it? Well, people who don't fly say, hey, that's easy, just quit flying. We don't want to do that. This is a country based on freedoms, and folks in aviation absolutely love it. We want to get the best we can out of our airplanes. We don't want to become statistics in the process. So how do we reconcile all this and get better at decision making? Well, one of the things we got to remember is experience isn't always the best teacher in the aviation world, is it? You want maybe somebody else's experience, and that's why the most widely read aviation articles and longest running in aviation magazines is I learned about flying from that and flying and never again in AOPA pilot magazine. We're reading where pilots confess that they've made mistakes and uh, to keep you from making the same state, mistake. Bruce Landsberg, our executive director of the Air Safety Foundation said this and I thought this was great, I'd never do something that stupid again. And unfortunately that's the way a lot of us learn. Now sadly what we got to remember, too, is we're all capable. There's not a single person in this room, if you've been flying for any length of time at all, including myself, that hasn't done something, right? It may not have been life-threatening. It may have been a simple mistake, but we're all capable of it. And that brings me to a real important point I hope you take here at home today from this, if nothing else. If I could get to every pilot in the country as a safety guy and try to convince them of this, I believe we can change the whole attitude about flying and substantially reduce this safety rate. And that's this. Folks, listen closely, please. It does not matter how many hours we've got in our logbook. It doesn't matter how many years we've been flying. Doesn't make any difference how many different types of aircraft we've been flying. The bottom line is that we are all human and capable of making a mistake. And if you remember that and take it with you from the time you do your pre-flight planning to you tie the airplane down and get back into your automobile and leave the airport, you're going to change the way you approach the decision making as a pilot and I think we can bring down this accident rate. If you don't think big boys and complacency can come bite you, how many of you remember this incident? 1994, Fairchild Air Force Base, sad situation. Talk about setting up for poor decision making. This pilot was in a base he normally wasn't based uh, at and he had his wife at the airport. They're preparing to do a little air demonstration at the airport. He had crew members on board the airplane that normally didn't fly with him. So what happened? He's got a show to put on. Now, I tell you, what's scary, there's a video clip with this. With the video clip's grainy, it's much more powerful to see one clip taken or one photo extracted from that video clip, and it tells the story, doesn't it? And no survivors, that little dot you see just to the right of the aircraft, that's where somebody tried to punch out. He didn't make it either. But you know the results of this? When this accident occurred, people came from out of the woodwork to tell the Air Force investigators that this pilot had an attitude problem. It wasn't the aircraft attitude, it was his. And that brings us to another point. And this is tough. You don't want to step on our own feet or step on our shoes. But if we're going to bring down this accident rate, we have to do this self-evaluation thing that can make us a safer pilot. Folks, the most dangerous, absolutely most dangerous attitude we can have in the cockpit of any flying machine is arrogance. There's a big difference between confidence and arrogance. And I hope you know that. Unfortunately, you watch all these old aviation movies, it looks like arrogance is just supposed to be part of a pilot's demeanor. No, it's not. It's supposed to be uh, something that we don't want to ever infect us in aviation. We want to be the good guys, but confidence different. Confidence means you know what you can do, 
but just as importantly, you know what you can't do when you're in the airplane so we don't make similar mistakes. Here's what we're going to do today. The FA has given me permission to have everybody in our studios here, and if you're watching at home on the World Wide Web, that's great too. We want you to participate in watching some scenarios here because scenario-based training has been discovered works well. Why? Because you get the whole big picture. You don't have to sit home and just look at the writing on the walls or the, the NTSB reports. They're written by nature and legalese and try to determine what really happened. You get to watch a pilot making the decision making, talking about the flight. And so we're going to take you on a little VFR flight this morning and we're going to watch this pilot, see his decision making uh, process at work, see the motivation for making the flight, watch him closely and let's see if you can help this guy become a little bit of a safer pilot. First of all, let's meet him and find out a little bit about his background and where he's going so he can make things a little bit safer with this. Whoops, let me see if I can get this clip to rerun again. Sorry about that, I think it's coming up here. But this guy's got a real interesting background and we'll find this out in a minute, here it comes. He's a private pilot, he has uh, no instrument rating and he has 225 hours total time. Is that important to know? I hope it is. He's going to be flying a 172 that is IFR equipped, and he's not with a handheld GPS. He's going from Quincy, Illinois, down to Warrington, Virginia. He's planned a fuel stop in Ohio. Let's meet him and hear his story. It had been a really tough week. On Wednesday, I found out my favorite Uncle Max had died of a heart attack. They were really close. I ended up flying to my hometown in Illinois for the funeral. Still not quite sure why I decided to fly myself all the way out there from D.C. Maybe I just needed some time alone to think things through. Maybe I was hoping the flight would be the one bright spot of the weekend. I, I don't know. I thought I'd be able to leave right after the funeral, but there were so many relatives there. I got caught answering questions about work, the wife, the kids, the pets, I mean, you name it. When I realized how late it had gotten, I made a quick trip to the airport and climbed into 172. I had to get home that night because my wife Emily and I were leaving for Vegas the next day. We've been planning the trip for months. Luxury hotel, all you can eat buffets, had Elvis impersonators, the whole nine yards. Oh, and did I mention the non-refundable airline tickets? I wasn't about to miss that flight. I wanted to go, of course, but Emily was really looking forward to some time away. I just didn't want to screw things up by being late. I was tired and a little upset after the funeral, so it probably wasn't the best way to start off. The weather started out looking pretty good. The forecast said I'd probably run into a scattered layer between India Dayton, but it was supposed to stay up around 2,000 feet. And I figured I could always drop down through if it started to fill in. There was a chance of some isolated thunderstorms popping up later in the afternoon, but I didn't really think that'd be a big deal. I thought I'd be home by the time they mounted to anything. The problem was that the weather was supposed to get worse later that night and then stay bad for a couple days. I'd probably be stuck if I didn't get home that day. So I took off. And things were looking pretty good. In clear skies, smooth as glass. When I was about two hours from my fuel stop, I remember thinking to myself, man, this is going to be one seriously boring trip. <laughs> anyway, I, I was maybe an hour and a half from my fuel stop at Greene County when I noticed that scattered layer flight service had told me about. <laughs> didn't really look like much, so I didn't think I'd have any trouble getting there. I'd just land, get some gas, check the weather, and launch again. A while later, I was kind of zoned out when I happened to glance outside. The cloud layer was filling in fast. I thought, wow, <laughs> that, <laughs> that doesn't look so good. So I decided I'd better check the weather. Wind, 220 at 8. Ceiling, broken, 1,200. Visibility, 4. Altimeter, 2987. That sounded kind of bad. I mean, I was shocked by how fast that cloud layer closed up. I was kicking myself for not paying more attention to what was going on outside. I was still too far out to pick up the AWOS at Greene County, so I had no idea if things were any better there, but it didn't look promising. On one hand, I was thinking that I should drop below the clouds right there because I didn't want to get trapped on top. On the other hand, those holes really didn't look very big and I hadn't done any instrument flying since my private check ride. If I dropped down now, I'd have to worry about towers and airplanes and, well, I just was nervous about scud running the rest of the way. And there was a chance the clouds would clear up. If it started to get worse, I could always come down. I didn't know what to do. 
Okay, this fellow's got himself in a little bit of a pickle here, doesn't he? No doubt about it. And uh, so what do we do to try to get this pilot safe? Well, first of all, what was the motivation for making the flight? Are you watching that get home itis we've talked about ad nauseum in the, in the aviation world materialize before your very eyes? Absolutely. Was it a good day for this guy to be making a flight? Probably not. He's under stress. He lost his favorite uncle. And sometimes we may think, and we've all probably thought this at some point during your flying life, man, it just seems that life is, when you fly, all your troubles just seem to stay on the ground. You know, the key two words in that phrase is seem to. They really don't. You're just distracted from them for a while. And as long as nothing happens during that flight, it's uneventful, everything goes routinely, probably nothing will happen. But if something bad does happen during that flight, the chances are you're emotionally overtaxed and here comes the bad decision-making process. So this guy's got himself in a pickle, though. That's getting in the air. Now he's got a situation. He can't do a 180. It's gotten worse behind him. He sees this cloud deck kind of rapidly filling in. He's got one little hole below him that he can kind of sneak down and get below this thing, or he can take the risk, if he wants to, of continuing to fly on and see if something gets better. So what do you think he should do? Should this guy go ahead and descend now and get underneath while he's got a hole, or should he take the risk to stay on top, remembering this guy has no instrument rating, has no hood work since he took his check ride? What should he do? Somebody holler it out for me. To send now. That's all right. Let's go back and meet with our pilot here, and let's give him this uh, decision from you, and see what happens. Let's give him your decision, and see what happens to him along the flight, and see if it's the right decision to make. The sectional didn't show any tall towers in the area, and the ground was pretty flat. So I decided I'd be better off to go ahead and drop below the clouds right there. I started the descent, and pretty soon I spotted a hole that looked big enough. Nothing. Cloud clearances weren't my number one concern. Pretty soon I was thinking, man, this is not as big as it looked. Then I actually got in the clouds for a few seconds. That had me in a minor panic. But I managed to get myself under control and fly the airplane. And just like that, I was out of it. Honestly, at the time, it was kind of a rush. All through your training, everybody's constantly telling you to stay away from the clouds. So when you get in them the first time, you're pretty much expecting something horrible to happen right away. But I got in there, and at the time I thought, it's kind of neat. A little scary, but neat. When I got down below, it was pretty cruddy. I couldn't see very far, and the clouds above me were really close. I knew it was legal, but I was pretty uncomfortable. I decided I'd better turn on the landing light and really keep my eyes peeled for other airplanes. But I didn't end up having any real trouble getting in. Even the landing went well. I wasn't thrilled about the way things had gone, but I was feeling okay. All right, he took your advice. He made it down to the runway, but what happened during this phase of the flight that sets him up big time for poor decision making in later flights? He got away with it. He did it. And think about his confidence level. Did this guy, did this pilot, our fellow aviator, did his ability to make wise decisions on weather drop immediately? Did his weather minimums drop? Yeah, he got away with it. He's been bit by this big bug. I've done it before. And folks, that's what get pilots. The good news in decision making is this. Pilots do not go out and make poor decisions when it's very obvious. You just don't see general aviation pilots, as a rule of thumb, go out and launch in level five thunderstorms. What usually happens is it's a lot more insidious, where it's marginal stuff that comes back and bites us. You know, GPS is messing with us in that too. Air traffic control sees a lot more pilots squawking 1200, the VFR code, in marginal VFR conditions than ever before. Why? Our confidence level's up. We used to think we wouldn't go flying in those kind of conditions because we were afraid of running into another airplane or the tower or something. No, we were scared of getting lost. And now that we got Magic Box on board, we launch out and head for those areas. And it can be kind of scary, so don't over depend on that. Now, if he had stayed on top, and uh, this is a, a our version of a two-hour seminar, we don't want to show you the clip, but in this particular scenario, which you can go and see online, you can go take a look and you'll see that the same thing happens again. He gets, he makes it, he lucks up and gets on the airplane, but his confidence level is skewed for future flights. Now, 
He's at his fuel stop in Greene County, Ohio. So let's go meet with him there a little bit and let's watch the process of decisions that makes him decide whether he's going to continue this flight or stay on the ground. So let's see what happens while he's at the FBO. At the FBO, the radar was showing those isolated thunderstorms they talked about earlier, but it didn't look like they were going to amount to much. They seemed to be dissipating as they moved north, and the heavier cells were staying off to the south. The METARs and TAFs looked about the same as before, broken layer between 1200 and 1400. Some of the stations were still calling it scattered, visibilities around five miles. Not great, but I figured I'd been able to handle it so far. Big meals and biggest lobsters I ever saw. Um, Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm in pretty good shape, considering. How about yourself? Well, doing well. Doing well. Will you be uh, visiting with us for the evening? Uh, nope. Headed back to Warrington, Virginia. Just side of D.C. Well, I know where that is. Back in the late 50s, I used to do some charter work in a converted Lockheed Ventura. Had a regular passenger from Warrington. Nice fella. <laughs> yep, those were some good times. Man, I could stand here and tell you about those days for hour after hour. I bet. Anyway, remember one night we launched out of uh, Baltimore, headed for Pittsburgh. Takeoffs in that old bird, always a thrill. I mean, you'd push those big prats up to 55 inches and she'd flat and go. And at night, if you look back, you could see the exhaust flames shoot past the trailing edge of the wing. <laughs> anyway, we launched out of Baltimore, headed for Pittsburgh. And old Joe Ingalls was flying. You know, he'd been a flyweight boxing champion in the Army. So you didn't want to mess with him. You had and that's the story of how I became the only man ever to land a lucky Ventura in downtown Latrobe, Pennsylvania. <laughs> what do you think of that? Wow. Oh, that's quite a story. <laughs> you bet it is. <laughs> but I don't want to take up your time. Are you planning to go IFR? Uh, no. I'm... I'm not instrument rated. Uh, you know, if you ask my advice, uh, you better be careful. It, it doesn't look so good out there. And this time of year, you can always trust the storms to come up faster than you think. It can box you in, you know. I mean, you play yeah, hell getting out. But I, uh, I need to get home. Uh, I didn't have much trouble getting in here, and the weather looks like it's going to be about the same. Tell you what. If I was you, I'd just call it a day. I mean, get a cold six-pack in a motel room. These people here will be glad to drive you over if you ask. Yeah, them. well, uh, thanks. But I think I'm going to go up and take a look anyway. You know, I mean, there are quite a few airports between here and there. Things get worse, so... Well, it's your choice. But be careful. You don't want to smack into a mountain between here and there. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was a little annoyed with Pops back there. I know the guy meant well, but on some level I resented the lecture. I already knew the weather wasn't very good. He did have a point, though. The weather could get worse, and I was going to be flying over some mountainous terrain. Plus, I was tired and starting to get a headache. But I wasn't ready to give up yet. Writing off a thousand bucks worth of airline tickets and my vacation, uh, and disappointing my wife, there was definitely an argument to be made for trying to get a bit closer to home. If I could get within a couple hundred miles, at least I could rent a car and drive the rest of the way wasn't an easy choice. Okay, let's talk about his decision-making process here. Did this guy do anything right during his stop there at the FBO? He checked the weather. It looked like he did a pretty decent pre-flight. Do you know that can even build some false confidence with us? If we think we go through the proper procedures, then everything must be okay. Don't let that happen to you. But despite getting that new weather briefing and taking the time to go online and check the current weather, what was the best briefing he got? From old Pops, wasn't it? You know, if you get a hold of this guy, you want to tell him, hey, look, there's a reason Pops is old, right? He's been through some things. He's probably learned the hard way. Plus, that weather briefing he gave as a local pilot was extremely important. Remember what he said about the thunderstorms? They always pop up faster than usual or faster than forecast around here. We need to listen to those folks. So he's at that point now where he's kind of almost frustrated. Did he show a little bit of touch of that arrogance thing as a result of his reaction to Pops? Yes, he did. And yet he should have been listening to him. So this, should this guy, what should he do, stay the night? Or should he go up, even, should he even take the risk of going up and taking a look? 
No, stay on the ground. And that's, so let's go ahead and let's go back and give him that decision that he takes Pop's advice. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to spend the night here and do what Pop said. And let's see what happens if he makes that decision. Yeah, I uh, changed my mind. It just doesn't look very good out there right now. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Uh, the guy who was here earlier said somebody might be able to give me a ride to a motel. Sure, not a problem. Great. Thanks. It was actually kind of funny. When John called to tell me he was going to have to stay overnight, he acted like he thought I was going to start yelling at him. He sounded relieved when I told him the truth. But I'm glad he decided to stay put. Of course I was disappointed. But it's not like I can't deal with a change of plans. I hadn't even been thinking about the weather, but when he told me it might be tough to get across the mountains, I was like, thank goodness you're going to stay in a hotel. I see the plane crashes on the news. Seems like there are more of them lately. I know John is a good pilot, but it scares me to think of him taking chances in an airplane, especially over something like a couple of airline tickets. See, all of his fears of trying to please one person were really unwarranted because I know sometimes we feel pressure. How many of you read the full NTSB report on the JFK Jr. accident? If you did, you found out that there was pressure to please during that disastrous flight as well. But remember, if somebody really loves you, they want you to do the right thing. Now, I know sometimes we get picked on about that guy's wife's reaction and not everybody's wife would be quite that understanding. In fact, I was doing this seminar in Portland, Oregon, and a guy hollered out, where is she at? But in all reality, we want to be safe. We want them to be safe. And so please be careful. And remember, don't let people affect. They can have an amazing effect on you in the aircraft and on the ground. And there's been studies that have proved that. I could stay here and give you true anecdotal evidence to back that up all day, but we just don't have time. Now, if he decided to continue on, the problem with this decision is this, is that he would be making a poor decision even to go up to take a look because pilots even make worse aeronautical decision making once they're already in the air and we'll talk about that in just a minute. This situation here is typical that gets us in trouble in general aviation. We, if we have a trip that we perceive is extremely important and we're on the borderline as far as the risk is concerned, whether it's marginal, we may have to do a little scud running or whatever. In other words, it's possible we may make it okay then it's easier to take the chance. So be careful. Stay away from that mission mindset, we call it. You know, don't, you're not flying a kidney to somebody in most cases. What would you say to an NTSB investigator if you're still around? And a really important question to ask yourself as part of the decision making before you make every flight is this one. Will this really matter a month from now? Think about that. A lot of things that today seem so important, so devastating, you go to sleep and wake up the next day, and in the big scheme of things, they just didn't seem that investigating. Believe it or not, um, decision making, you can do it well. And we have the tools and education to perform. And if you try to skip by it and try to hide around the decision making process, eventually the truth will come out. I don't care how good you are performing. Anybody seen the cop car cameras they have today? Why do they? And they're even wearing little wireless microphones like I have now. Um, it's amazing how people can do some remarkable performances as far as getting in, uh, in a situation. This is a female sheriff's deputy pulled over this guy from Texas, and by her own admission, she said she got in a little bit of trouble over this because uh, she had never pulled over a genuine character from Texas before, and she thought he was a hoot, and she put him through a little bit more of the rigor road than she normally does in a routine uh, potential DWI traffic stop. And this guy did a remarkable job considering the pressure he was under, but eventually, the moral of this story is, the truth comes out. Watch this. How are you doing? Well, I'm great. I'm doing okay. How are you? Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not so good, because you were uh, weaving all over the road there. Well, can Sir? we get one thing straight? I have not um, been drinking. We need to, okay. And right hand to the nose. Yes. Yeah. With the left hand. All right. And back out. I, I need you to recite the alphabet from Z to A backwards as fast oh, as you can. From can you Z do that to A? For me? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Z, Y. X W V U T S R Q P O N M L K J I H G F E D C B A. Uh, All right. 
remarkable. I've actually never seen anybody do that. Oh, my bladder Feel the toe. I'm, I'm not worried about your bladder right now. Sure. Okay. Ten. All right. All right. Well, you got pretty good balance. Thank there. you. Uh, I want you to step, bump, step, bump, bump, step, bump, step, bump, bump. Five, six, seven, eight. Step, bump, step, bump, bump, step, bump, step, bump, bump. bump. Pot of beret, kickball change, step, clap. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. You know what would be good is if you hit kicked and then you kind of did that and then a barrel turn and then ha! You know? That was, that was good. That would be. That was you know, really good. You a dancer? No. No, 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 not a, I'm, I'm just drunk. <laughs> oh, <laughs> again, you, 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 right now. You, oh, folks, you. I told you, eventually the truth comes out. Don't try to cheat or you'll get called at it eventually. You know what? Good aeronautical decision making, whatever you call it, it's all about doing the right thing at the right time, even if nobody's watching you on uh, television or capturing on video. That's what it's all about. Decision making is also as much about staying away from the tough calls as it is learning to make them. Now this quote was attributed to an anonymous author, I believe is actually the person who wrote Stick and Rudder said this, and it's a great one. Superior pilots use their superior judgment to avoid situations requiring the use of their superior skills. In other words, you're well trained, you know how to get out of trouble, but more importantly what? We try to avoid getting in that situation in the first place, don't we? Are you legal? It's amazing how many people make the decision purely based on, is it legal? Um, Ernest Gann, the guy who was the right great author of Fate is the Hunter and other great books, rule books are made of paper, they will not cushion an unexpected meeting of rock and aluminum, will they? You know, it's amazing how easy it is to make those decisions based on legalities. You go up to a major class Bravo airport, in general, the inner ring's about seven miles. So you can fly seven and a half miles around this major, busy, metropolitan airport, and as long as you're underneath the altitude of the second ring, you don't have to talk to anybody. That's legal. But is it safe? It's incredible. Well, the story somebody even asked me to tell here today, I, and I hate to repeat things when you've been here before and talk, but it is a great illustration of, of how you can get in trouble with this legal versus safe. I get picked on by my son about my diet all the time. And in fact, he came home from school. It's the school's fault. I blamed them because they sent him home with that food pyramid thing, you know. And he got in the car, picked him up, the little circle drive of school. He said, Dad, you don't eat right. So see, that put me in a bad position. At home now, I have to set a good example for him by eating right. But one of the reasons I took this job is I get to travel. And while I'm away from him, I hit every one of those Cracker Barrel restaurants in North America because he's not there to watch me. So I was sitting in one one day and I got, I did pretty good, I thought. I got biscuits and gravy and bacon and hash brown. I, I did get a Diet Coke, so give me a little credit. But well, there's a guy sitting beside me about a table away, and he started looking at me. You know, when you're my size, people say anything to you. They realize it's not like this guy can whoop us, so they just go ahead and say anything. And I'm sitting there, and this guy's watching me eat, and all of a sudden he said, uh, Hey, buddy. And I didn't know him. I said, Yes, sir. He said, You have any idea what all that junk's doing to your body? And I said, Sir, my grandfather lived to be 94 years old. And he said, Eating such as that? And I said, No, sir, from minding his own business. <laughs> now... See, it was legal for me to say that, but was it safe? No. I ended up running to my car in the parking lot, scared of the fella, but the bottom line is, it's not just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe. Another great question to ask yourself, could you pass your private pilot check ride today? You want a humbling experience? Go to the FAA.gov website and pull up the test bank questions for the private pilot quiz. You'll be surprised how much we forget just over a period of time. And that's why this proficiency training is so important. Remember, folks, it is not about how many hours you've got in your logbook. It doesn't matter. I'm emphasizing this again, aren't I, for a reason. It doesn't matter how many years you've been flying or how many different types of aircraft. We are all human. You see how it works. You see how easy it is to get in a situation where we're going to make poor decisions. The more you know about yourself, that's important. The more you know about your aircraft, the more you know about the flight and preparation, the better prepared you are to make right choices.
And here I am again to talk about technology again. This gets us in trouble too in knowing all the information we can. It's awfully easy to get to an aircraft and know that that new GPS unit not only has the frequencies of all the airports you're flying on uh, through or over at the time, but also many of the new generations even have a situation where they have what? The information as far as the, uh, the whether or not the FBO is open at the hour that you're flying at that minute, whether or not if they're not, they have one of those GPS or, or based uh, credit card machines to buy gas. That's all in the GPS unit. So do you see how this can lead to a false sense of security? Knowing that information is accessible to you and that technology in the aircraft may prevent us from doing better pre-flight planning. The problem from that is, yes, that information's there, but if you get in a full-blown emergency in that aircraft and you have to come off of that screen, that important navigation screen, to start looking up information that we probably should have become prepared and noted before that happened, that leaves us with losing a lot of valuable insurance in the form of time to handle that. Please don't let the technology mess with us as far as pre-flight planning is concerned just because it's in the airplane. You know, the go or no-go thing, most pilots do a good decision. I told you, we just don't go launching out into level 5 thunderstorms. But once we're in the air, aeronautical decision-making deteriorates. How many of you saw one of our AOPA Air Safety Foundation seminars a few years ago called The Last Five Miles? Anybody see it? Well, if you did, there was a scary, very scary statistic in there, and that is in 2004, every single accident, 100% of them in 2004, took place within five miles of a destination airport or an airport the pilot was attempting to divert to. That's scary, isn't it? And why? Because once we're in the air, sometimes we may make the right decision to go, but do we make the right decision on when to stop? Let me give you a scenario. I use driving a lot, having been a traffic watch pilot for so many years, but I think it's also a good way to illustrate and prove to you and to all of us how easy it is to make bad decisions. We've all been on trips on the car. Imagine this scenario. You get a call. Your buddy's trying to find you. You say, my lands, I've been trying to find you. You had your home phone cut off because you went to all cell. We didn't have your cell number. I've been trying to look for you. My daughter's getting married Saturday. They want you to be the best man at the wedding. I know it's Monday before Saturday, but can you come? And you say, yeah, I'll be there. So you decide you're going to hit the road. If they live 340 miles away, when they move, it's in a new town, you've never been there before, but you say, I'll go. So you think, well, Friday I'll get off work about 4 o'clock, so I'll leave a little earlier before the 5 o'clock rush hour. I'll hit the road. I'm used to staying up to 10 or 11 o'clock at night anyway, so it won't be too bad a trip. So 4 o'clock you head out on Friday. Man, you've looked at the map. It's all interstate all the way. And you're thinking, this is it. I'm on the road. And you start driving. Now, you, you even were such a detailed oriented as a pilot, you even went to the DOT website in your state and you looked up if there was any road construction going on at that time to determine whether there's any problems you're going to hit and there was nothing there. But you get a hundred miles up the road on that 325 mile trip and guess what's there? Road construction that didn't show up on the inner. And you've got those orange and white barrels narrowed down to one lane and you're crawling through there. You know what that does to you. You see people walking by you with grocery carts, you know, on the interstate, and you get, pre man, I could have walked fast. Your pressure, the stress level starts going up. You finally get on the other side of that and say, thank goodness that's over. You get another 50 miles up the road and here's a car accident. Let me tell you, you don't have to be a traffic watch pilot to know what happens to a car wreck. You know they have an emergency meeting of the International Society of Rubberneckers who have to slow down and look at every single detail of the accident scene, right, as they go by. By the time you get on the other side of that, you are tired. You are wore out. You feel it. You know how you get sensitive when you get fatigued. You're feeling that car. You've read AAA magazine. You said, well, roll the window down to get tired so you'll be, you know, have some wind blowing on. You're so tired, you're even listening to rap music on the radio. That's how tired you are trying to jar yourself back awake. And you're wondering by this time, how much further have I got to go? Finally, one of those green mileage signs comes by, and it says there's still 62 miles left to your trip. Let me ask you something in reality. Now, some of you in this room may have an amazing ability 
to have that kind of decision-making skill and that kind of, of a gumption to make that decision. But I'm asking you as an overall worldwide view of things, how many people do you think, knowing they're that tired, knowing they're that sleepy, still knowing that they have another hour left of that trip, would go and pull off at the next exit and get a hotel room and try to finish that trip in the morning? How many of us? Not many of us, folks. And this is the way we ought to be thinking. These human factors are extremely important. You know, we all think it won't happen to us. This is pictures of men at work. If you don't think we're capable of making bad decisions, take a look at this. Isn't this absolutely incredible what decisions we make? We're up there flying, uh, making even people at work. Look at this. Here's one. Think about, it usually takes a minute on this one, but that's... The guy in the white shorts is from FEMA. No, I'm just kidding. No, I didn't mean to say. <laughs> what about this one? This is called the potential for convective activity. Right? I love this one too. Check that out. Now, not only look what the guy's doing to prop the truck up, but look at what he's doing. He's welding near the gas tank. Boy, this is good decision making, isn't it? Folks, listen. The NTSB reports are loaded, absolutely loaded, with pilots who aren't here anymore or seriously injured because they thought, it will never happen to me. 76% of the time we get in trouble in aviation, it's our fault. And usually judgment-related pilot error. So I hope you live, leave here today from this seminar coming to the conclusion of I need to be better at making decisions. I need to take proficiency training very seriously. There's a reason the airlines, the reason the military pilots are safer is because they're forced to. In general aviation, we don't want to regulate that. We certainly don't. We don't want that to happen to us as pilots. But at the same time, if we go out and make these decisions on our own, it'll work. You know? We have a dwindling pilot population in this country. That's why Phil Boyer, the president of AOPA, has put a new shot into the Project Pilot Program, trying to get you to introduce people to the world of aviation. And I hope you go and take advantage of doing that at some point. There is certainly a, a reason for that, and so we want you to get involved. But another thing that we can do to protect that, uh, pr that uh, pr public perception of aviation is to keep these things in mind. If we go out there and do something crazy in an airplane, we are sending general aviation naysayers fan mail, aren't we? So we have an obligation not just to ourselves, the people we fly over, and the people who fly with us to be safe. We also have an obligation to the whole rest of the pilot community to try to be as safe as we possibly can we fly. It can mean our freedom to fly. One more note before I let you go. I mentioned to you earlier that the most dangerous attitude for a pilot to have in a cockpit is arrogance. Folks, please remember that can be our most dangerous detriment to public perception. There's something interesting about human nature, which was what we've been talking about all morning, and that is... When people meet somebody, they think everybody in your group is like you. You ever been to a store and got waited on by a jerk? You think the whole store is like that. You don't like the store. Please remember this. When somebody meets you and they find out that you're a pilot, they think all pilots are like you. Please put on the white hat and become a goodwill ambassador for general aviation. But people like us, it's so much easier to sell them on our freedom to fly. Thanks to all of you. One personal note, it amazes me that you folks are here. For those of you who are watching at home, just turn this on the World Wide Web and you're watching. These pilots came in on a beautiful day in Florida to sit in on a safety seminar instead of being outside. That speaks volumes about your character, folks, as pilots and as aviators. We don't take that lightly. Thank you for coming, and I hope you have fun at the rest of Sun and Fun for the weekend. Appreciate you coming today. Thank you.